thanks for coming. Today I'm going to talk about the effects of bullying on children and youth and it's a four-part series so the first part we're going to concentrate on examining the links between bullying and mental health and understanding the temporal sequence so is it the case that kids become unwell as a consequence of being bullied or is it the opposite? In the second part, I'm going to talk about the heterogeneity in mental health outcomes. So why is it that some children fare better than others when they're being bullied? Uh, part three will explain why being bullied hurts so much. So we'll talk about the mechanisms behind it. And then finally, for part four, we're going to discuss what can be done to reduce bullying, in particular in schools. So speaking of mental health, I'm going to first of all just put it into context, the scope of the problem. So in Canada, about 15 to 20 percent of children and youth have serious mental health issues. So that means that 15 to 20 percent of Canadian youth could be diagnosed by a psychologist or psychiatrist for having a mental health problem. 50 to 75 percent of mental health difficulties in adulthood began in childhood before the age of 15. So if we're concerned about adult mental health and not necessarily children's mental health, um, we're putting our priorities in the wrong place because it begins in childhood, it's an entrenched experience, it's long lasting. Mental health problems in childhood are the leading cause of health-related burden. And in adults, it's the leading cause of disability worldwide. So depression trumps every other disorder. Most children with mental health disorders do not receive services. And unfortunately, when they do receive services, um, it's not necessarily based on evidence. So we have a significant practice evidence gap. So my call for action, so I'm somebody who's been studying bullying for 15 years and I'm quite passionate about it. My Canada Research Chair is in Children's Mental Health and Violence Prevention and that's purposeful because I actually think, uh, based on my uh, understanding of the literature, my contribution to the science in this area, that bullying, if we decrease bullying, we will decrease mental health problems in children. And the reason I say this is because the research points strongly to a causal pathway between being bullied and having mental health difficulties. So what is bullying? Well, bullying is a term that's used loosely. Everybody's using it today. Uh, they're using it to discuss little incivilities amongst peers and the like. But when we're talking about bullying, and when I'm talking about bullying today, I'm using a purposeful definition. I'm talking about a person who's exposed repeatedly and over time to the negative actions on the part of one or more persons. So when we're talking about bullying, scientists and practitioners in this area, we're talking about something that happens over and over again, or typically happens over and over again. Sometimes you can have a one-off experience that's so awful that the fear of it happening again would be the repetition. It has to have an imbalance of power. And assessing the imbalance of power can be difficult for adults because we don't reside in the playground, right? So we don't necessarily understand the politics of the playground. Um, but in any event, there, there has to be an imbalance of power. And it's intentional. So I guess a shorthand version of this definition would be that bullying is a systematic abuse of power. The prevalence rate points to the fact that Canadians get bullied at a high frequency and actually it's quite consistent with other countries, studies, that, uh, studies from other countries looking at prevalence rates. So about 30% of Canadian youth are bullied occasionally, so once or more a month. But 7 to 10 percent of Canadian youth are bullied on a daily basis. So that means over half a million children and youth in Canada are bullied every single day. When you look at the prevalence rates where they compared the richest nations in the, country, in the world, um, you see that Canada is not faring very well. We're in the bottom here. So one, we're one of the worst per, uh, perpetrators of uh, bullying um, when you compare us to other countries. Sweden and Italy are doing quite well. Another thing to note is that when we compare our prevalence rate over time, most countries are showing a decline in bullying with the exception of Canada the United and the UK. So for some reason, Canada and the UK are you know, consistently high on bullying. Now what's the link between bullying and mental health? Well, I need to differentiate the um, profiles between those who are bullied and those who bully others because their mental health outcomes are quite different. So I'm going to fir first focus on children who get bullied and they're often uh, times called victims. 
We just did a review paper that was published in American Psychologist. I did this with my good colleague and friend, Patty McDougall. And we looked at the long-term consequences of bullying. And we, um, the inclusions of studies in, in this review are, um, you know, they had to be longitudinal, they had to be well executed, they had to control for prior victimization or mental health issues. So we're looking at the unique contributions of bullying on mental health in um, later life. And what you see is that it's, it's linked to, um, it's impairing virtually every aspect of functioning. So being bullied is linked to academic difficulty, school truancy and avoidance, increased absenteeism, somatic complaints, stress-related illness, physical health problems, low self-esteem, depression, social withdrawal and isolation, social anxiety, loneliness, suicide, and aggressive behavior. So what seems to be the case is that when kids get bullied, they either get sad or they get mad, but something happens. There's also studies that are emerging now, so the data are growing up. So we have an idea of what the very long-term consequences of bullying are. So this is a study that was published just recently in the American Journal of Psychiatry, where they looked at individuals who were bullied in childhood, and they looked at their health outcomes 50 years after the fact. And what they found was those who were victimized in childhood were more likely to have problems with depression, anxiety disorder, and suicidality in adulthood than those who were not bullied. The striking part of this study is that they said that the effects were similar to those being placed in public or substitute care and an index of multiple childhood adversities. So being bullied in childhood had a stronger impact, long-term impact, negative impact on mental health functioning than being placed in foster care or living in extreme poverty and the like. This is not unique. Another study that was just published a few months ago in the Lancet Psychiatry compared childhood bullying, so being the victim of, of bullying, to being maltreated by your caregivers or having um, both uh, negative uh, events happen. Well, it'd be more than one event, but you know, being bullied and being abused by your caregiver. And what they found was that, and the reference category here would be children who were not bullied and were not abused by their caregiver. They found that if you were maltreated in childhood, your chances of having mental health problems in adulthood were 1.7 times greater than those who were not bullied or maltreated. If you were both bullied and maltreated, your chances of having mental health problems in adulthood were 4.7 times greater than the person who hadn't experienced um, exposure to these types of violence. And, um, sorry, sorry, my apologies. If both, it was 3.5 times. But if only bullied, it was 4.7 times more likely that you would have problems in adulthood. So here we're comparing child maltreatment to bullying to child maltreatment plus bullying, and the thing that's emerging as the strongest predictor of, ma of adult mental health difficulties is being bullied by your peers. So what's the temporal sequence? So it could be the case that children are being bullied because they have poor mental health to begin with. So the peer group is picking up on something that's a little bit different, and they're bullying them, and as a consequence of that, it's exacerbating something that's already there to begin with. Or is it the case that children come to school healthy and they become unhealthy as a consequence of poor treatment by their peers? The research tends to support that children become unwell as a consequence of poor treatment. In fact, I would go as far as a scientist to say that there's a causal link between being treated poorly by your peers, being bullied, and having mental health problems concurrently and over time. So if we look at internalizing problems, which would be things like depression and anxiety, study after study, and these are very well con conducted studies. So these are studies that are longitudinal, where we're controlling for prior associations, so we can look at unique effects of, the, of bullying on mental health. What you see is that study after study is showing that peer victimization is linked to increased internalizing problems in ensuing years. In fact, a meta-analysis looked at this. So a meta-analysis is where you put all of the studies together to get a summary statistic. Because studies are done differently. Different populations, different ways of measuring bullying, different ways of me measuring mental health, depression, and the like. 
So when you put these all together, even though the science was done somewhat differently across these areas, do we find an effect? And in this meta-analysis by Tofte, what they found was it does that victims of school bullying do tend to become depressed later in life. And they followed people up to 36 years after the fact. So there's, there's a lot of science coming out. And in recent years, a lot of science showing that it's not just affecting them today, it's affecting them 30, 40, 50 years into the future. Now what about externalizing problems? Things like aggression, substance abuse, and the like. What you see is that peer victimization again leads to that pathway. So from peer victimization to externalizing problems. Again, controlling for those unique pathways so that we could say that in a sense there's a causal relation. <coughs> now, I would be, you know, I'd be I think a little um, deceitful if I didn't also acknowledge that there are some studies that show that there's a symptom driven pathway. Although most studies show that it's from being bullied to having mental health difficulties and meta-analyses support that pathway, there are studies that show that for some children you can see mental health difficulties before and then they get bullied and then it exacerbates it. So there is a segment of the population where that is their pathway. And um, so we see that with internalizing and externalizing problems. So for example, we published a study not too long ago in the Journal of Abnormal Child Psychology where we found that internalizing problems in grade five, so depression and anxiety, predicted peer victimization in grade six, which predicted more problems with depression and anxiety, which then created another you know, vicious cycle of being abused in the following year. So you see, in a sense, these kids can't win, right? So they're starting out on well, they're getting treated poorly by their peers, maybe they're picking up on some of the, the issues that are associated with depression, and, um, and they're being abused um, accordingly. Now, in terms of academic functioning, and I know teachers are quite interested in this, um, what are the pathways? Well, first of all, our knowledge is more limited, and it's less straightforward. And I find this a little incredulous, because the bulk of people who study bullying are educators, um, or people who are attached to faculties of education. So I'm always struck by the fact that we don't have as much evidence on academic functioning. What I mean by the fact that the um, pathways are often indirect, or if they are found, is um, I think we have an issue when, look, when we look at academic functioning. I think the data need to grow up and we need more studies. So I, I'm not suggesting that there's no relationship. There are studies and you know a few of them are noted here where um, and they're longitudinal and they're showing that victimization leads to poor academic performance and school avoidance over time. But what I think is happening in terms of academic functioning is that it's mediated through attendance. So I think if we did studies that were longitudinal, we'll find it. But when we look at them in short intervals, we don't find associations. So why I think if we start at grade five, you get bullied in grade five, you stop showing up to school. So maybe in grade six, your attendance isn't that great. But it hasn't affected your grades yet. It, it, it affects your grades through attendance. So then if we measure it up to grade seven, then we will see that it has an effect on academic achievement. So far, most of the studies on academic achievement and bullying are short duration. So you've got these really short intervals, and I think we're missing what's happening here. So I'm suggesting the mechanism is through school attendance. So the mental health profile of children who are victimized doesn't look that good, right? I, I suggest that it, uh, it impacts virtually all aspects of their functioning. It affects them today. It affects them into the future and long into the future. But what about the mental health profiles of children who bully? So I was really interested in children who bully, and in particular, high status bullies. So when I did my dissertation, I was particularly interested in the most popular kids in the school. Because my experience from being in high school were they were the biggest bullies, right? So it never, it always struck me as curious um, when we portrayed the bully as somebody who was marginalized, somebody who was, um, you know, not socially sophisticated, somebody who was high on psychopathology. And you see um, popular media replete with examples of this. So I would say Nelson from The Simpsons is a great example, right? This is a guy who's high in psychopathology, um, you know, poor social cognition, uh, impulse control is not very well defined, right? So there's a lot of problems with Nelson. 
um, but it didn't fit. It, you know, certainly I could think of kids like that that fit that profile, but most kids in our high school that were popular were also me. So I did a study um, with uh, my supervisor, my good friend Patty McDougall, where we used cl a class play. And a class play is a way to get at reputational biases. So you have kids pretend that they're the director of a class play, and as the director of a class play, they can nominate people who fit a variety of different roles. So we use the term peer nomination. So they can nominate people who are aggressive, they can nominate people who are popular and the like. So based on that, we created um, categories of individuals who are very high on popularity, so they were one standard deviation above the mean, and very high on, on being a bully, being nominated as being a bully. And based on that, we found that 90% of kids who were nominated as popular or who had power were um, bullies. And only 10% of kids who were nominated as being bullies had low power. So here we have 90% of kids who are bullying others are perceived as powerful by their peer group. And only 10% who are bullying others are perceived as low on power. So what do we, how, if we contrast these two groups, so we have high-powered bullies and low-powered bullies. And remember, bullying is a systematic abuse of power, so I would expect that most would have power. If you compare the two groups, you see that the high-status bullies, so the high-powered bullies, are the most aggressive. So they're more aggressive than these low-powered bullies. They're also the most popular kids in the school. And they're controversial. Some people like them, some people don't. They're also perceived as being attractive, wealthy, good athletes, and their leadership is also one standard deviation above the mean. So the social elite in this study that involved, you know, over close to 600 children in grade 6 to grade 10, so the social elite of the school were the ones who were abusing the peer group the most. Since this paper was published, it's been, it's been replicated around the world. It's been replicated in Finland, in the Netherlands, the United States. Everybody is finding this in their country. The high-status individuals bully others. So let's think about kids who are victimized tend to be marginalized. Kids who bully others tend to not be marginalized. So would you expect then their mental health to be compromised if they're not marginalized. And that's what studies are showing. So when we look at children even who were um, categorized as bullies or as victims in childhood and look at their health profiles later on, what you see in this one study by Wolke et al, that victims of childhood bullying, including those who bullied and were victims, so bully victims, were at increased risk of poor health, wealth, and social relationship outcomes. But pure bullies were not. So it seems to be the case that being a bully in childhood and adolescence is, in a sense, and I don't mean this to be true, obviously there's consequences, but it would seem it's, it has no consequence to their health and well-being. And why is this? Well, I truly believe that these divergent pathways have to do with the fundamental need to belong. So the fundamental need to belong is, a fu is fundamental to human motivation, right? And so when you're victimized by your peers, it interferes with this fundamental need to be part of a group, to be liked, for affiliation. Whereas when you bully others, it comes with status, unfortunately. And because of that, it does not interfere with a fundamental need to belong. So it doesn't surprise me that children who bully others seem to be doing all right, and children who get bullied are not doing well. So that concludes part one. Any questions? Yes. Thanks, that was great. Um, in terms of the bully victims, people who bully as part of that relationship, would they be more likely to be low status, or do we have data on that? Yes, so bu bully victims are the lowest in status, and they also have the worst mental health outcomes. So um, it a, represents a very small group. So you need a very large study to find them. Typically, between 2 and 3% of individuals would be classified as bully victims. So they bully others, they're victimized, and they are really impaired. So if you look at all outcomes and across all studies, they're the ones who are highest on psychopathology and the like. Yeah. I just wanted to ask about resiliency. 
because we, we see that in school. Some children can be it have the exact same circumstances, but they have a resiliency about them. Have you measured that at all in, in your, any of your studies? So we have. And so when we continue forward, um, we're going to be looking at this heterogeneity. So that's going to be part two, is explaining why is it that some kids fare better than others when they're bullied? I have a quick question. Yes. And that is, do you know if bullying is or has been added to Vincent Folletti's um, Adverse Childhood Experiences Survey? I have no idea. Okay. Um, and I was curious to know if there's any, diff any um, research about different types of bullying, like is cyber bullying versus physical? Like yes, there's a lot of studies coming out. And it's interesting because if you were to just back up seven years ago or, you know, between 10 and seven years, uh, seven to 10 years ago, um, there was a lot of studies suggesting that cyberbullying was increasing. I mean, it was new, right? And we were really concerned about cyberbullying. It must be different because it, you know, it happens online where you can be anonymous. Um, you know, it's more goal-directed because you got to think it through when you do it. So, um, you know, when you look at that literature, it seems to suggest that cyberbullying is quite distinct from other forms of bullying. But since then, the literature has caught up, and many, many studies have been done. And in fact, there's a special issue just coming out in aggressive behavior that um, I was part of. I'm an associate editor at that journal that shows that it's very similar to traditional bullying. In fact, what's, what differentiates, um, like if you're thinking about outcomes, what's a better predictor of outcome is not the type of bullying that you endured, it's the severity. So severity and not type. Okay. Um, some of the uh, data that we've been putting out around anxiety and depression in schools, and it's, it's actually, a lot of the children are saying it's around social media. So I, I don't disagree with you with the other points, but I think it's because social media has an immediate impact and its spread is greater. So children that you wouldn't necessarily count as bullies normally, when something is posted online and other people like or don't like, it's having that mental impact on these children because suddenly they're out of the social circle. And, and some children don't even realize that what they're doing when they do that, and m maybe more so now, they're actually bullying or they're contributing to the bullying that's being led. So I think that's why it's having a bigger impact. And, and the data across the province here in Alberta is saying that that's one of the, the biggest pieces around anxiety and depression. U the universal level, obviously not. Yeah, so I think, I'm not suggesting that cyberbullying doesn't have an effect on the individual. It absolutely does. And there'll be some individuals who are only cyberbullied. Um, and there'll be some that are only physically bullied. And there's some that are only verbally bullied. But I'm speaking on average, right? So I'm not talking about one-off experiences or, you know, these smaller cells um, that absolutely exist. And it's true to that individual's experience. What, if you put all the literature together, what it seems to suggest at this point is that traditional bullying correlates quite well with cyberbullying. And cyberbullying tends to be a spillover effect of what happens in the hallways. Yeah.